Hello, PSI 21 Elementary Astronomy. This is Professor Ringwald, and in this class, I'll be covering Chapter 13 on eyes, small telescopes, and CCDs, which are the components of the sensitive digital cameras that astronomers use. So let's start with the human eye. Human eye is like a camera with a lens in front to focus the light and a detector in back to detect the light. In the eye, the detector is the retina. In an old fashioned camera, film was the detector. In a modern digital camera or camcorder, it's the CCD detector. The retina has two types of cells. The cones are in the center of the eye's field of view. We use these for seeing eye resolution, such as when reading. The rods are around the edge of the vision field. The rods are larger than the cones and so have less resolution. They're more sensitive though. They're useful for seeing dangerous things at night out of the corners of one's eyes, such as predators or cars. They're used in prehistory and ancient history for predators. Now, cars. Here is an illustration. Human eye, like a camera, a lens in the front, a detector in the back. With an old fashioned film camera, this was a piece of chemically treated film. With a modern digital camera, it's a digital imaging device, such as a CCD, like you find in astronomical cameras. In the human eye, it is the cells of the retina. The optical nerve takes the signals from the retina and sends them to the brain. The retina in the back of the eye has two kinds of cells that, set, that sense light. The rods, which are narrow and therefore are used for high resolution, they can see lots of details, such as when reading, and the cones, which are bigger and usually around more common around the edge of the eye, but present pretty much everywhere in the retina. The cones um, are larger, so they get less resolution. They can see less detail, but they're more sensitive because they're bigger and gather more light. Uh, therefore, if you want to see something really faint when looking through the eyepiece of a telescope, it can help to look slightly to the side so that your cones are detecting the light. Although you can see less detail, they can see fainter, they're more sensitive. So this trick of averted vision can be very handy for seeing faint things through the eyepiece of a telescope that you wouldn't see if you look straight at them. Human eyes become colorblind in the dark. The brightest stars can activate human color, color vision in a dark sky. You go up to the mountains and you uh, see, um, you can see all kinds of color in uh, bright stars. But here down in Fresno in the city with all the city lights, all of that gets pretty much washed out. Uh, the thing is that human eyes become colorblind at night. The brightest stars can activate human color vision in a dark sky. The human eye still isn't particularly sensitive to red light in any case. Looking through binoculars or a telescope, most WI galaxies won't show much color, even if they're spectacularly red or blue in pictures. The eye will see them as ghostly bluish white, unless one looks through a very large telescope capable of delivering enough light to your eye to activate your color vision. So what a camera sees, the brilliant reds, of H alpha radiation. This is a photo taken by Hubble Space Telescope. When you look through the eyepiece of a telescope at exactly the same image, even in a really nice dark site way up in the mountains, everything looks, you don't see the red at all. You see a, blow, a ghostly bluish white. Because again, the human eye goes colorblind in the dark at low light levels and is not terribly sensitive to red light even in the uh, broadest daylight. So between the sensitivity of your eye and uh, the colors it's sensitive to, the colors it can, it can see, basically these brilliant reds you don't see at all. You see a, 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 a ghostly bluish white. Um, a 
Therefore, ever since astronomical cameras were new, digital cameras were new, starting in astronomy in the 1980s and moving into the mainstream in the 1990s, and now just about all cameras, including the ones in your cell phone, are digital, digital imaging devices. CCDs have gone out for commute, commercial cameras, CMOS detectors have come in, but other than the way that they read the, uh, the, that they read the information out, that they read the image out that they take, they're really not that different. But ever since digital cameras were new in the 80s, there's been this debate swirling about they show you, they're lying to you, they're showing you um, things that the eye can't see. And well, um, no, they're not. They are showing you what is actually there. The reason why what the eye sees is different from what's actually there is because the eye is just not up to the job of seeing faint colors of light, especially in the dark at low light levels. Human eyes are adapted to daytime use. Our eyes are best when used in the daytime. So when you're observing at night, it's really a very unusual situation for your eye. In ancient times, of course, humans needed to have good vision in the daytime so they could hunt and gather and get food, it wasn't all that necessary to have detailed um, vision at night, though, just as long as you could see predators creeping up behind you and see that there's something there and run away quickly. Um, so the human eye is not terribly sensitive um, at, at low light levels. Therefore, when we actually look through a telescope, what we're seeing is something that the eye is showing us that isn't really a good reflection on reality. A digital camera shows you what is there, that the eye simply is not up to the task of seeing. Okay, optical illusions. Many people assume that the human eye and brain are like a video camera, which sees the world exactly the way it is. Many people also assume that human memory is like a video recorder, which makes records that are always reliable, complete, and that don't change. Both these assumptions are quite wrong. There's quite a lot of onboard processing your brain does to images and that your eyes do to images even before they go to the brain. So, since it can take about a tenth of a second or so for nerve signals to travel from the eye to the brain, the eye often guesses at what it is seeing. Human eye is very good at, at, at sensing patterns. You can recognize faces of people you didn't even uh, know existed, like the old uh, sensation. Oh, you must be Mrs. Smith's daughter, and she is. And I didn't know. I didn't even know Mrs. Smith had a daughter. And we use that every day in our lives and our social interaction with each other. We read, we recognize people by their faces and we read their emotional states, their impressions from the expressions on their faces, some of which can be quite subtle, but the human eye and brain are very good at seeing it. So that is what we have. And uh, quickly, when things go faster, than a tenth of a second, faster than human uh, typical human um, uh, interactions with other humans, the eye often guesses at what it is seeing. And sometimes it guesses wrong. Many optical illusions demonstrate this. For example, closely spaced lines that appear to shimmer or move when the eye clearly cannot um, because they're stationary patterns that are printed on paper. The book Eye and Brain by Richard Gregory has many examples of this, and I have a few here. For example, this shimmering, the shimmering motion that you see when you look at this. And if you don't see the shimmering motion, move your eyes around. You'll see it looks, it shimmers. That shimmering motion is not real. If you can't see the motion, move your eyes around. The point is, it's your eyes and your brain trying to make sense of this, and they're not really doing that great of a job of it. And many optical, other optical illusions are basically the eye and the brain guessing at recognizing patterns and getting it wrong. For example, this 
it looks like the lines, the gray lines in between the black and white squares are not parallel. Looks like they're farther apart here and closer here. Well, actually, they're parallel lines. It doesn't look like it, but the effect of the black and the white show uh, basically give you the optical illusion. Likewise, the distance between there and there is the same as the distance between there and there, even though it doesn't look like it because of the context of the outward arrows here and the inward arrows here. In this figure, how many blots, how many black dots do you see? There are in fact none. And likewise, we see a square here when actually it is just four circles with uh, quarters of them cut out. And this circle is the same size as this circle, but because this circle is surrounded by bigger circles and this one is surrounded by smaller circles, it looks like this one is bigger than this one. Most optical illusions have this nature that you, your eye and your brain are guessing at recognizing a pattern and getting it wrong. There is a well-known illusion in astronomy called the moon illusion. The eye and the brain perceive the moon to be larger when it's near the horizon. And I actually reproduce these, this illusion on campus here. When the moon is low in the sky, we perceive it to be bigger. And when it's high in the sky, we perceive it to be smaller. This is because of, the, again, the context that you see the moon in. The eye and the brain perceive the moon to be larger when it's near the horizon. And we've often seen that. When I was a kid, I thought that the moon illusion that when the moon just rises or just sets, when it's low in the sky, it looks bigger than when it's high in the sky. And I thought that had something to do with the refraction of the Earth's atmosphere. It doesn't. It's purely an illusion. If the perspective near the ground worked for the sky, notice I've drawn some lines for perspective. And if this worked in the sky, the moon would fill the large circle. It doesn't. So the eye and the brain perceive the uh, moon high in the sky to be smaller than it is when it's low in the sky. Therefore, the moon illusion. The yellow in this harvest moon in September is from dust in Earth's atmosphere, which we get lots in Fresno. The, the yellow isn't an illusion, it's real. One of my term paper suggestions for psychology or other majors is perception and illusion through the telescope. Uh, once I had a student write a paper about this in which the student confused real for illusory, real physical effects for illusions. He thought that many real effects, such as the Doppler effect, were illusions. They're not. The Doppler effect is a real effect because light is a wave. Therefore, when a star comes towards you, it looks bluer than if it were stationary. And if it, goes, if it goes away from you, it looks redder than it would if it were stationary. That's not an illusion. That's a real effect. It really is blue when it's coming towards you and really does it re and really is uh, red when it goes away from you. So the yellow in this harvest moon is another example. That is not an illusion. That's real. So much dust in the Earth's atmosphere filters out light and gives the moon a yellow uh, appearance. The moon can appear to be blue when there is smoke in the air. Smoke, uh, dust absorbs light, particularly um, uh, violet and blue light, therefore making things look redder than they should look, therefore an overall yellow moon. The moon can also appear to be blue by smoke high up in the air from forest fires. Um, Again, this is not illusion, it's real. Blue moon also means the second full moon in one month. On average, this happens once every six years. This gives us a saying, once in a blue moon. When the moon is actually blue because of uh, smoke high up in the uh, air, uh, we hope would be rare. In the labs, we use small telescopes. And small telescopes uh, 
I've told you about optics, how they form images, the difference between reflecting and refracting telescope. These are both reflectors. What I haven't told you is how they point the telescopes. The simplest way of doing it is an altazimuth mount. Altitude means up down direction, at least in this context. Azimuth means left right direction. So an altazimuth mount basically is the simplest possible thing you can have. It points the telescope up and down and left and right. And this is great for beginners. You can point, and really it is not that big of a deal. An equatorial mount is more advanced. It needs to be lined up at the point in the sky. This axis needs to be lined up uh, the point in the sky directly over the Earth's North Pole, the North Celestial Pole. Pointing at the bright star Polaris gets you within a, a one degree of there, and uh, there are more precise ways of doing it. And some uh, equatorial telescopes have a little a little telescope built in so that you can look through here and see uh, where it is. The thing is an equatorial mountain moves north and south, uh, north and south in this direction, and east and west, east and west in this direction. So north and south around this axis, and east and west around this axis. What this does is it can compensate for the motion of the Earth. An Altazma telescope, you point it at your target, it stays at the target. After a couple minutes, the Earth has rotated enough that you're no longer on your target. Therefore, if you've got a long line of novice observers like we have in the labs with this course, uh, the first or second student can see it, but uh, the instructor needs to be alert to put it back uh because the third or fourth uh, student will probably see nothing at all as the earth rotates you're no longer on whatever it is you're pointed at um an equatorial mount can compensate for that it moves the telescope continuously from east to west as the earth rotates of course stars appear to rise in the east be high in the sky in the middle of the night and set in the west and this oops this can compensate for it and having a little drive on here to drive this is called a clock drive because it moves the telescope half as fast as the hour hand of a clock. The hour hand of a clock, of course, goes all the way around once every 12 hours. A clock drive on a telescope makes the telescope move all the way around the sky once every 24 hours, the same rate as the Earth is rotating. Therefore, if properly set up, uh, compensates for the motion of the Earth. Again, when I was 11 years old, I, my parents noticed that I was interested in astronomy. They did the right thing and asked me about buying a telescope at the local planetarium. For reasons I still don't understand, they gave us some poor advice. They told us, don't buy a telescope unless you're willing to spend at least, uh, actually, $2,000 for it. It was $300, but this was the 1970s. I need to update this. My poor mother made it sound like she'd been kicked in the stomach, something like, oh, the next day she gave her she gave me her seven by 35 bird watching binoculars and as it turned out that was exactly the right thing to do because i learned to observe with those binoculars today there do exist good telescopes for children that cost only about 200 dollars there are also plenty of crummy department store telescopes they're still called department store telescopes even though department stores are endangered, are endangered species these days but i bet you you can get department store uh, telescopes from amazon not that I have tried, they're horrible telescopes. The buyer must beware. A good way to see many different telescopes in use at the same time is to go to a star party hosted by the local amateur astronomy club. And we've got a good one here in Fresno. They're called the Central Valley Astronomers. Look up their webpage, cvafresno.org and type Central Valley Astronomers into an internet search engine such as Google or Bing, and it should take you right to their webpage. Um, binoculars have many advantages as a first telescope. They're inexpensive. A good pair of seven by, seven, seven by 50 binoculars could cost only 50 to $100. Therefore, if you, buy a tele, if you buy it for the kid, and two days later, he tells you he's now interested in dinosaurs. He still got a pair of binoculars good for lots of other things, like searching for dinosaur fossils. Binoculars can be used for other things, nature watching, sports, etc. The kids' interests change, therefore they can be uh, still be useful. 
Portability for binoculars is excellent, except for the very largest giant binoculars. One of the biggest advantages of binoculars is the magnification is low, only about seven power at 10 power, say seven power for a seven by 50 or seven by 35 bird watching binoculars or 10, 10 power for 10 by 50 astronomical binoculars. It's therefore easier to find things. And for a novice, that's important. And still they give a quite respectable view of familiar things like the moon. 10 power or a magnification, again, instead of half degree across, the moon is now five degree across, about as uh, big across as your outstretched hand at arm's length, as opposed to the width of your, half the width of your thumbnail um, at, the, at, at, at arm's length. So pretty good image of the moon, even with $50 binoculars. Uh, <laughs> another advantage of binoculars, is that the image is right side up and not left right reversed as in a telescope. A reflecting telescope, of course, you're looking into a mirror, so it's gonna left right reverse the image. And even many refractors will show the image upside down because astronomical telescopes are supposed to be pointed up at the sky. So it's thought to be not a big deal. But when you're looking through a telescope, having the image upright, not upside down, but upright, and not left, right, reversed, um, is in mo in, as in most telescopes, uh, can make it much easier for a novice to find things. Uh, we, I've noticed students at our labs seeing, for example, a satellite going through the sky and they see it going that way and they think that means that they have to point the telescope that way. Actually, they have to point it that way since what they're seeing is left, right, reversed. None of this, binocular, none of this uh, nonsense applies to binoculars. Binoculars show things the way your eyes see them. Correct side up. In other words, not inverted, but right side up and not left, right, reversed. Right on the right and left on the left makes it much easier for people to find things, for novices to find things. Probably in my mind, the biggest advantage though, is that using both eyes, the human eye and brain can just plain see better. Advanced amateur astronomers often prefer binoculars. And when I'm just casually observing the sky for fun, I prefer binoculars too. You could just plain see more with both eyes. Why exactly this is so, I'm not sure anybody knows what would be a good term paper topic for a psychology or physiology or pre-medical major. Um, maybe it's because that the differences in your eye are averaged out. So you see uh, a, a field of view with fewer aberrations, fewer flaws in the optics of your eyes. Maybe, but I'm not sure anybody has looked into this very carefully. For binoculars, by the way, seven by 50 means seven power magnification. So you, a seven by 50 pair of binoculars show you objects that are seven times bigger than the original. So in other words, instead of the moon being half a degree across, it'll only be three and a half degree across. And with a 50 millimeter aperture, seven by 50, 50 is 50 millimeter. 7 by 5, uh, 35 binoculars, bird watching binoculars that are small and light. You can carry them around your neck all day long and it's not a big deal. And uh, my mom gave me seven by her 7 by 35 bird watching binoculars. Uh, some astronomers will say these are not suitable for astronomy, but they sure work for me. 7 by 15 by 10 by 50 were designed on purpose to be used at night. Notice 50 means bigger aperture. The lenses are bigger, therefore they gather more light. You can see in the dark a whole lot better. These are good for astronomy since they have more aperture. 11 by 80s or 20 by 70s are giant binoculars and they really require a tripod being too heavy to hold steadily. 7 by 35 bird watch, you can binoculars, no problem. You can hold them uh, all night and it's not a big deal. And 7 by 50s or 10 by 50s, again, they're light. But 11 by 80s or 20 by 70s, 80s, of course, they have big lenses and 70s, they have nearly as big lenses and high magnification too. 11 or 20 power mean that they have to be held very steadily and a big heavy pair of binoculars are very whole, very difficult for most people to hold steadily. So giant binoculars generally require a tripod to hold steadily. 
In recent years, there have been image stabilized binoculars. They use Steadicam technology to eliminate the shaking, the effect of one's hands shaking. They're more expensive, but well-made ones are worth it. If you ever saw the film, The Blair Witch Project, that horrible shaking of the cameras, they should have used slightly more uh, expensive cameras with Steadicam technology to take that shaking out of them, the shaking of people's hands out of them. It's like adaptive optics, little microprocessor control, little computer control of optics that sense the shaking and... Uh, move the lenses of the binoculars such that a lot of the shaking is, is removed. So again, binoculars can be excellent for telescopes because they're so portable. Even with giant binoculars and tripods, I have demonstrated the classes. You can take three pairs of binoculars and tripods in their carrying cases and three pairs of them uh, sling over your shoulder and uh, walk right into class with them walk right out of class with them at the end of the at the end of the class so eyepiece observing is fun and educationally valuable and far be it for me to say anything bad about it my biggest regret uh is not being able the, my biggest regret for this class is because of the COVID 19 pandemic we cannot have these outdoor labs and it's really a shame because they all they all go over very well Notice the lab instructors pointing at things in the sky with green lasers. Never point a green laser at anybody. They're blinding, but pointing up the sky. It's like a planetarium pointer in the real sky. And here are the telescopes. These ones are now azimuth mounts. And the red lights are because red light is easier on one's night vision. Gives you just enough so that you can see what you're writing if you're taking notes or doing the lab exercise. But not enough to spoil your night vision. So they're often used uh, um, in the military, for example, red lights are used uh, for nighttime operations. Uh, uh, so a crew, for example, on the deck of an aircraft carrier can see what they're doing, but people in other ships far away cannot so easily see what they're doing. So eyepiece observing is fun and educationally valuable and far be it for me to say anything about it, but, the stereotype of the learned astronomer doing research on uh, the universe, finding out more new things about the universe by looking through the eyepiece of a telescope is a stereotype that's been, that's been out of date since the invention of photography uh, in the 1800s. Old fashioned chemical photography was invented in the 1800s. The very first uh, Jouer type was uh, 1843. The chemical processes changed and got more sensitive. So while photography was a popular hobby, even in the 1800s, it really wasn't until the 1890s, towards the end of the 1800s, that the chemical processes in photography got sensitive enough to be useful in astronomy. And one of the pioneers of this was Edward Emerson Barnard. He was orphaned at age nine and there were no social programs to take care of orphans. So they put him to work as uh, an apprentice for a photographer. And we learned quite a lot about photography and he grew up and he became an astronomer and he used his skills as a photographer to pioneer the study of uh, astronomical photography. And he took these beautiful pictures, for example, the Horsehead Nebula he discovered, this is Barnard 33, because to him it looks somewhat like a horse. It's a dark cloud of dust in space that is blocking the light from stars on the other side. It is not a hole in space. Uh, and you can't see it with your right aided eye. You needed uh, chemical photography, which could see much fainter to discover this at all. These dark nebulae are important because that's where stars form. The dark dust cools the gas down and the gas atoms can uh, cool down and move slowly enough so that they can condense under gravity and form stars that way. This was largely developed by Edward Emerson Barnard, largely at Lick Observatory just outside of San Jose. 
photography with film or with film or plates is now largely obsolete thanks to digital detectors such as CCD. What I mean is old-fashioned chemical photography. It was the mainstay of astronomy from the 1890s to the 1980s, but ever since the 1980s, we've used charge couple devices, CCDs, because they are nearly perfect detectors of light. And I'm not hyping it. They are nearly perfect detectors. CCDs are the electronic chips that take the picture in most digital cameras. Actually, CMOS detectors are nowadays. I need to update this. Camcorders and webcams. Their use was pioneers by, pioneered by astronomers in the 1890s because of their high sensitivity and linearity. Yet another case of abstruse science paying off in the real world, because if the only science you're interested in is stuff that's immediately applicable, you quickly run out of stuff to apply. So it's important to keep new stuff on the frontier. And every now and then, something that seems totally useless at first will seem wonderfully useful. CCDs were originally developed uh, by a computer company as memory devices. It was only later noticed, hey, these things can detect light too, and they're much better than old fashioned chemical photography. CCDs are very sensitive and very linear, and this is why they're, they've become so popular in astronomy. By sensitive, uh, CCDs are very sensitive. More precisely, CCDs have high quantum efficiency which specifically means over 90% of the starlight falling onto a CCD is recorded. Compare this with older TV sensors, which are about 10% quantum efficient. So an old TV sensor like used in the 1950s with a big camera, um, basically only caught about 10% of the particles of light, only 10% of the photons. CCDs, a good CCD nowadays can do over 90%. A good CCD nowadays looks black because it reflects back very little of the light. They absorb light tremendously well. The human eye is only about 2% quantum efficient. Really, the human eye is best adapted for use in the daytime, not really at night. Uh, Old-fashioned chemical photographic film or plates were notoriously not sensitive. They were also notoriously nonlinear. CCDs are highly linear which means that if you leave the camera shutter open, in other words, you expose for twice as long, you get twice as much signal. Photographic film was notorious for having problems with this. This is called reciprocity failure. If one exposes twice as long with film, one rarely detects twice as stars, stars that are twice as faint. CCDs are therefore photometrically accurate. Brightness measurements of stars are reliable. Because of their linearity, CCDs have high dynamic range. This means that they can see both bright and faint objects in the same uh, image. An example where film photography fails are photos taken by astronauts in space, which almost never show stars in the background. A lot of conspiracy theorists would tell you that's because they're all faked, it's all a hoax. Well, I, folks, I grew up in Central Florida. I saw the launches of the Saturn V moon rockets. And that was a hoax. It sure was a good one because you could see it from my parents' house. You can see them from our parents' house uh, 60 miles away. Um, the real reason is because most pictures are taken during daylight. The bright sun overpowers the faint stars. CCDs are also all uh, digital with images going directly into a computer. There's no need to scan as with old-fashioned chemical photographic film. And in the commercial marketplace, digital cameras, actually mostly using CMOS detectors, not CCDs, uh, have almost completely um, um, made chemical film obsolete. Your grandfather, your grandmother may still have a digital ca uh, film camera, but eh, even grandmothers these days are, have digital cameras. So since 1980, astronomers have used digital CCD cameras like the one on this tail, uh, on the tail of a one meter telescope, the 40 inch telescope, Mount Laguna Observatory outside of San Diego, which belongs to San Diego State. And here is an actual CCD camera taken off of a telescope and looking in, and there's a sensitive chip, the CCD. CCDs are very sensitive at over 90% quantum emission, over 90% of the photons of light, over 90% of the particles of light that fall on a CCD make a signal that can be read out and recorded. So in other words, are detected. So for a long, for a long time, 
now. Astronomers have not done their research by peering through the eyepiece of a telescope. Nowadays, they typically watch a monitor of a, a computer monitor while uh, typing commands to point the telescope through a computer and uh, looking at the monitor sometimes. This one, for example, um, we're using um, an old style TV sensor and actually moving the telescope northwest, east, uh, north, south, east, west with a hand controller. But largely these days it's done through a computer with a cat in your lap. Uh, you gotta have the cat, of course. And again, this is an example of a space picture taken in broad daylight. So the camera is uh, set or automatically sets itself to get good images for daylight, which are millions of times brighter than night. Therefore, you can't see stars. You generally cannot see stars in the background and in, uh, in, in space pictures. From the surface of the moon, the astronauts who were there said, again, all the moon missions, all the Apollo moon missions, all six of them with two astronauts each, so 12 moonwalking astronauts, they, uh, they noticed that, again, they were all during daylight, None of them landed on the moon at night. And so in the daylight, they're in direct sunlight, as bright as broad daylight. And the moon is about as reflective as an asphalt parking lot broad daylight. And uh, because of this, because their eyes and their cameras were adapted to daylight conditions, when they looked up in the sky, it looked black because there's no air on the moon, no air molecules to scatter the rays of the sun, the light of the sun, and make a nice blue sky like we have on Earth. No, it was black, but you couldn't see the stars. It looked, they said, alien. Uh, it looked glossy black. The stars were too faint to be seen with the bright sun right there. What they could see was the Earth, and the Earth is four times bigger than the moon, so imagine something in the sky that looks four times bigger than the moon, and as one of the Apollo astronauts said, it looked like a little blue marble, the most beautiful little blue marble you could possibly imagine. Nearly all of the moonwalking astronauts couldn't get their eyes off of it. The one exception was Harrison Schmidt, the geologist who flew on the last mission. He looked down at the rocks and all of the astronauts had terrible trouble sleeping over in the moon. They all had naps or rest periods. And as Buzz Aldrin on the Apollo 11 mission said, it's very difficult to get any sleep at all because, oh my gosh, I'm on the moon. And the last three missions stayed over three days, so they had to sleep. But as uh, the commander of the last mission, Gene Cernan noted, all he ever got were cat naps. He, just the excitement of being on the moon was just too much. Harrison, the geologist, slept, and he said he had wonderful dreams about rocks. And so here's a space picture. You cannot see stars in the background because it's in daylight, and the camera and your eyes are set for the brightness of daylight, which is millions of times brighter than in the night sky. And you can reproduce this with a film camera, as I've done here on campus. Go stand directly under a bright street light. You cannot see stars with your eye, nor can you see them with a film camera. You can see the moon, however, with both your eye and a film camera, even if you're standing under a bright street light at night, because the moon is as bright as an asphalt parking lot in broad daylight. If you use a digital camera and you are careful about it, you can get pictures of stars from space. This was taken by an astronaut, Sam Durant, friend of mine, who um, carefully did this. And that's the constellation Orion, the belt of Orion. There's the star Betelgeuse, the star Bellatrix, and the star Rigel. Actually, that's Rigel and Saif and the, and, and the, and the belt of Orion. Orion is the hunter. And uh, so with a digital camera and done carefully, turning the lights off, you can get a picture of stars from a space picture from space. Let me stop there for this class.